Hello, and welcome to the Butterfly Counts training program. My name is Andy Nacarado, member and volunteer for the North American Butterfly Association. Let's take a look at what today's training will cover. In today's training program, we'll go over a few topics that will help prepare you to participate in a butterfly count in Collier County, Florida. We'll talk about the reasons to do butterfly counts and the significance of the results that are collected. We'll talk about what exactly butterflies are and review the butterfly life cycle and some natural history. We'll look at how to identify several species of butterflies that are common in Collier County, and I'll give you some tips for how to notice butterflies out in natural areas while you're conducting counts. Before we continue with today's training, I would like to take a moment to introduce myself to you a bit further. As I mentioned, my name is Andy Nacarado. I am a member and volunteer for the North American Butterfly Association, and I've worked as an environmental educator for several organizations in Southwest Florida. I truly love looking for butterflies in gardens, parks, and other natural spaces. I volunteered for at least 16 butterfly counts for the North American Butterfly Association since 2013. And from all of those butterfly count experiences in natural areas across South Florida, I've really had the opportunity to hone my butterfly identification skills. In addition to the formal butterfly counts that I've participated in, I do my own butterfly surveys whenever I go hiking, whether that is in more remote wilderness areas like Beg Cypress National Preserve or community parks that are more accessible from town. Observing butterflies in nature and studying their natural history are two of my great passions. I'm looking forward to sharing what I know about butterflies and tips for spotting them during butterfly counts with you as we continue in today's presentation. So let's begin the first section of today's training program called Why Count Butterflies? If you ask me, there are plenty of reasons to count butterflies, not least of which it's a fun and educational outdoor activity. When you participate in butterfly counts with others, you are likely to meet some fellow nature lovers. And because you're spending time looking for butterflies specifically, you are more likely to see some butterfly species that might be new to you and observe some interesting butterfly behaviors that maybe you've never seen before, like courtship behavior and puddling behavior as seen on this slide. At the Gore Nature Education Center, there's even more specific reasons to do butterfly counts. They are a way to document which butterfly species are seen in the newly installed pollinator garden and which species are observed in the natural habitats that have been preserved at the Gore Nature Education Center. It's important to note that a butterfly count was completed back in August 2021 before the pollinator garden was installed. So we have baseline data for which butterfly species were present and how plentiful they were before the pollinator garden was planted. So this upcoming butterfly count is our chance to gather data after the pollinator garden has been established for several months. So afterwards, we'll be able to compare and contrast the butterfly species that are seen and how many individual butterflies there are both before and after the installation of the pollinator garden. Now let's zoom out a little bit from thinking about Collier County and start thinking about the big picture of natural history information for the state of Florida. 
And that's because where we are in South Florida is a very unique area where the subtropical zone, where different kinds of creatures and plants overlap. We do have some temperate species that come down the Florida Peninsula from further north in the southeastern United States. And we also have species from the tropics that have come up from the Caribbean. We have a lot of overlap and interesting species in South Florida. And because of our proximity to the Caribbean, there are some kinds of butterflies that we're more likely to see in South Florida, like the Julia shown on this slide, that might not be represented elsewhere in northern Florida or elsewhere um, further north and the southeast. So participating in citizen science projects like butterfly accounts help us contribute data to long-term studies of butterfly diversity and abundance. Observations that we make during butterfly accounts at the Gore Nature Education Center may be shared with butterfly conservation organizations like Butterflies and Moths of North America, eButterfly, and of course, the North American Butterfly Association. These organizations act as databases for any butterfly sightings that happen across the continent. And it's up to us to share observations that we make about butterflies in Collier County. Now you should have a good understanding for plenty of reasons why butterfly counts are important. So now let's move into section two of the training. What is a butterfly? The easy answer to the question, what is a butterfly, is to say that butterflies are animals. They're not the furry, warm-blooded animals that we often think of. But butterflies are invertebrates, which means they do not have a bony skeleton like we do. Instead, they have an exoskeleton that helps protect them. As we get more specific into the animal kingdom, we see that butterflies fall under the group of insects. And then more specifically from there, butterflies are in a group of their own along with moths, which is called Lepidoptera. You may be wondering how to describe the body of a butterfly. Butterflies have three main body parts, starting with the head at the top of the body, where the two antennae are attached that perform sensory functions for the butterfly. There's the two big compound eyes on the head, as well as the straw-like mouth part, which is called the proboscis. The next body part down is called the thorax beneath the head, and that's where the legs are attached. Like all insects, butterflies have six legs. And the final body part hanging down here is called the abdomen. I'm sure you're also wondering about butterfly wings. In this photo, we have a nice view of a black swallowtail. And of course, getting a good look at the wings of a butterfly is very important to help identify which kind of butterfly it is. Since the butterfly wings are the showiest part of the butterfly, they have different colors and different patterns. But first of all, it's good to explain how many wings butterflies have in the first place. You can see very well from this view that butterflies have four wings. They have two wings that tend to be larger towards the front of the body, and those are known as four wings, F-O-R-E. And then there's two wings towards the back of the butterfly, which are known as hind wings. And in the case of swallowtails, it is the hind wings that tend to have the tails. Now we can't have a conversation about butterfly biology and natural history without reviewing the butterfly life cycle. You can see here that there are four parts to the butterfly's life cycle. We'll start with the phase of the egg. Butterfly eggs are very small, about the size of a pinhead 
or the period at the end of a sentence. Adult butterflies lay their eggs on the leaves of their host plants. And the host plant is the type of plant that the caterpillar will eat when it hatches from the egg. The main job of the caterpillar is to eat lots of leaves until it's grown large enough and stored enough energy that it's ready to start changing into the third stage of the life cycle called the chrysalis or the pupa. When the caterpillar is getting ready to make this change, it hangs upside down in a J shape. It will shed its skin one final time to reveal the appearance of the chrysalis. And for many species of butterflies, the chrysalis appears camouflaged something like a dried old leaf because the butterfly is not able to defend itself when it's in this stationary metamorphosis part of its life cycle. But after all of the changes happen inside the chrysalis, it will be, of course, the final phase of the life cycle, the adult butterfly that emerges from the chrysalis. The adult butterfly is the stage that we focus on when we're doing butterfly counts, although we can count caterpillars as well. Although every butterfly experiences the life cycle in the same way, the life cycle that we covered on the last slide, moving from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis and adult butterfly, even though they all have that life cycle in common, there is quite a good diversity of butterfly species in South Florida, and they have quite a variety of appearances. And the different butterflies present in Florida can be grouped into six different families, as you see on this slide. We have swallowtails that tend to be quite large butterflies, and they usually have the tails coming off the hind wings. We have a family of sulfurs and whites. These can be small or large butterflies, typically bright yellow or white in color. We also have the family of blues and hair streaks. These tend to be quite small butterflies, but they are some of my personal favorites. Moving over here, we have the family of metal marks. There's just one species of metal mark, the little metal mark, that can be found in South Florida. The next family, the brushfoots, is composed of some of the more familiar species of butterflies, such as the monarch seen in this picture, as well as Florida state butterfly, the zebra heliconian. And the last family is the skippers. These are also small butterflies like the blues and hair streaks, but they tend to be brown in color, and there is quite a variety of skippers. Many of them look very similar to each other, and they can be quite a challenge to identify. And if anyone in this training has also participated in bird counts, or you like to go out birding or bird watching, you may have heard that identifying warblers and their winter plumage can be the most challenging because they all look like little brown birds. Well, identifying skippers is comparable to trying to identify warblers and their winter plumage. It's something a little bit more advanced, so don't worry if you're not ready to identify skippers right from the beginning. It's something that comes with time and practice and spending time with others who love observing butterflies. We all learn from each other. For the purposes of this butterfly count training, I thought it would be useful to compare the sizes of the butterflies that we expect to see with some fruits that we're all familiar with. This may seem a little bit funny, but when you're trying to learn about butterflies from books and photographs, sometimes it's unclear how big the butterfly is going to be in real life. So that's why I have compared the sizes of each of the butterflies that I'm going to teach you about today to a fruit that hopefully we're all familiar with. So butterflies that are very small in size 
they're going to be about the size of a blueberry. So if you open the palm of your hand and you imagine a single blueberry sitting in the palm of your hand, that'll be about the size of a very small butterfly. The example shown here is one of the blue butterflies, the Cassius blue, which we'll talk about more a little bit later. The next size up, the small butterflies are about the size of a cherry without the stem. So again, open up the palm of your hand, imagine a cherry sitting there, and that'll roughly be the size of any butterfly that I refer to as small. Then moving into the medium size category, those butterflies have a wingspan of about the size of a kiwi. The large butterflies like the monarch butterfly that we all know, their wingspan is about the width of a red delicious apple. And finally, the very large butterflies, like most of the swallowtails, have a wingspan about the length of a mango. So for each of the individual butterfly species that we cover today, you will see a picture of one of these fruits on the slide describing that butterfly so that you'll have an idea of the approximate size of the butterfly in real life. Now that we have adequately answered the question, what is a butterfly, we can move on to learning to identify some of the common species of butterflies seen in Collier County. Statewide for the state of Florida, there's about 170 species of butterflies, but don't worry, in today's training, we won't try to learn 170 species of butterflies. Instead, we'll be focusing on about 20 species that are commonly seen in our area. And the goal for today is simply to become familiar with what some of the distinctive features are between one butterfly species and another, or what parts of the butterfly's appearance are most noticeable to you that will stick in your head and help you remember, ah, that's a feature that I should pay attention to to help me identify this butterfly, even if I need to take a picture of it first and consult a butterfly field guide or some other resource afterwards. Okay, we're just about ready to start learning some of the individual butterflies that we're likely to see on our butterfly count. But first, I'd like to give you a tour of what kinds of information I'm presenting on these slides. You'll see the family of the butterflies at the top in the left corner. Then over in the right corner, you'll see some general notes about this group of butterflies. For example, for the swallowtails, they're very large butterflies, about the size of a mango. Again, we'll have the picture of the fruits to help remind you of the size of the butterfly in real life. The other note I have here is that swallowtails have noticeable tails. Then we'll have the names of the specific butterflies. In this case, we're looking at a comparison between the eastern tiger swallowtail on the left and the giant swallowtail on the right. And then I give you a list of some helpful features for identifying these two species. For the eastern tiger swallowtail, it is mostly yellow in color and it has black tiger stripes. For the giant swallowtail, it is dark brown to black for the background color with a yellow horizontal stripe running through the middle of the body. I also provide the host plant for each butterfly. For the giant swallowtail, it's the wild lime, which is commonly planted in butterfly gardens. For the eastern tiger swallowtail, the host plant is sweet bay, which is a tree that can be present in some of our wetland habitats. And I include which host plant serves each butterfly, because if you know your plants and you see a plant that you know to be a butterfly host plant for a particular butterfly, you can look around specifically for those individual butterflies. Another kind of swallowtail that we can see in Collier County is known as the polydomus swallowtail, 
And this one is a very distinctive swallowtail for a funny reason. It's a swallowtail that doesn't have any tails. You can see sort of a scalloped edge on the back of the hindwing, but no elongated tails. Another feature for the swallowtail is on the top side, a broad yellow band that runs around the exterior of the wings, and that gives it another common name of gold rim. And if you, again, look at the underside of the hind wings, there are some red markings as well as on the abdomen. The host plant for the polydomus swallowtail are a few species of pipe vines. The native pipe vine that is found in South Florida, as well as cultivated species such as the giant Dutchman's pipe vine, which is planted in many butterfly gardens and does attract the polydomus swallowtail. Now we're moving into our next family of butterflies known as the brushfoots. And this family contains a lot of butterflies that are familiar to most people. We're starting with Florida state butterfly, the zebra heliconian. This is in the category of large butterflies with a wingspan about the width of a red delicious apple. And the zebra heliconian is by itself on this slide because it's an unmistakable butterfly. There's no other butterfly in South Florida that we could confuse with the appearance of this one. You can see it's a black butterfly with light yellow stripes and as well as elongated forewings from side to side, which gives this butterfly another common name of zebra longwing. The host plants for the zebra heliconian are passion vines, of which we have a few native species in South Florida, but the most common one is the corky stem passion vine. Next up, we have another unmistakable passion vine butterfly. This one probably looks familiar to you as it's a very common butterfly seen in parks and gardens and in our front yards. This one is the Gulf Fritillary butterfly. It has a bright orange background with some black and white spots on the top side of the wings. If you look up here in the top right corner, the Gulf Fritillary, at least its wingspan is a little bit shorter than the Zebra Heliconian, so I consider it a medium-sized butterfly, about the size of a kiwi. And if we take a look at the underside of the wings, You can see another distinctive feature of the Gulf Fritillary butterfly. When you have a chance to see this butterfly perched, maybe sipping some nectar like it's doing in this photo, there are large white splotches on the underside of the Gulf Fritillary's wings. And when it's flying around on a bright and sunny day, those splotches flash silver and that really catches your eye when you're out looking for butterflies. Next up, we have another brushfoot butterfly. This time it's the white peacock. This one can be a very common butterfly in South Florida, especially certain times of the year. They can be very numerous. This one's a medium-sized butterfly, common especially along pond edges. That's where one of its host plants tends to grow. That would be the Herb of Grace host plant. It is a low growing succulent type of plant that has small white flowers. Its other host plant, the Turkey Tangle Fog Fruit, is really common growing in lawns. Some people consider it a lawn weed, although it is a native host plant for the white peacock butterfly. And you can see for the appearance of the white peacock, it is mostly white with tan borders. And these darker eye spots scattered around the wings. And those could be the inspiration for calling this a white peacock butterfly. If those dark spots reminded somebody of the spots at the top of a peacock's feather. This could be the section that many of you are waiting for. We are going to learn how to identify the monarch butterfly, which is very familiar to most people. 
but also to distinguish the monarch butterfly from a couple of lookalikes that may be less familiar to you. As we focus on the left side of the screen to start, you'll see the monarch butterfly is a large butterfly about the size of the red delicious apple. And I'd like you to notice the shades of orange on these butterflies. For the monarch on the left, it has a medium orange coloration and you can see the black veins outlined very distinctly on the wings. Now, if you look to the right side of the screen, this is a photo of a queen butterfly, which looks a lot like a monarch. They both use milkweed as their host plant, so they're related as well as looking alike. But take a look at the main background color of the queen butterfly. It's more of a mahogany brown than an orange, and the veins are not distinctly outlined in black as they are on the monarch butterfly. The monarch is often seen in butterfly garden situations. The queen butterfly can come to butterfly gardens as well, but I've noticed in my experience, I'm more likely to see queen butterflies in natural areas than coming into butterfly gardens. I'm not sure why that is. It could be some other requirement within the butterfly's life history that is found in natural areas rather than in a planted garden. So that was distinguishing the monarch butterfly from the queen butterfly. Now on this slide, we're going to be distinguishing the monarch butterfly on the left with the viceroy butterfly on the right. This time, the viceroy is an unrelated lookalike to the monarch butterfly. Although the viceroy really looks a lot like the monarch, it's actually not a milkweed butterfly. It does not lay eggs on milkweeds. The host plant for the viceroy is the Carolina willow, which is a small wetland tree found in natural areas in some of Collier County's parks. So coming back to the shade of orange on the butterfly, we have the medium orange again for the monarch and the black outlines of the veins. For the viceroy butterfly, it does lean more towards the mahogany brown coloring, similar to the queen on the last slide. The veins are outlined in black as well on the viceroy butterfly, so these probably look more similar to you, the monarch and the viceroy. But pay attention to this horizontal black line cutting across the middle of the hind wing on the viceroy that is not present on the monarch butterfly. So if you had one feature to look for to quickly figure out if you're seeing a monarch or a viceroy, you want to try to see is there this horizontal line running through the hind wings. And especially if it's early in the morning, and butterflies need to bask with their wings open, as we see in these photos, you may get more time than you think to get a good look at the butterfly and whether or not it has this horizontal black line on the hind wings. Now, I'm really excited to share with you one of my very favorite butterflies in South Florida. This is the ruddy dagger wing. In this photo, it's perched in an inflorescence of cabbage palm flowers, and it is oriented downward. This is the head right here. You can see the ruddy dagger wing is medium orange in color, similar to the monarch, but it has vertical stripes running up and down both pairs of wings. The forewings have this dramatic curve at the tips, and the hind wings have tails coming off of them. Even though the ruddy dagger wing has these tails, it is not in the swallowtail family. It is in the brushfoot family, like the monarch and the zebra heliconian. If you didn't already think that the ruddy dagger wing was a really cool butterfly, seeing this butterfly from the underside with its wings closed gives you a whole different perspective on the ruddy dagger wing. So now we're seeing the underside of the wings. 
and it gives you a different perspective on what these tails could do for the butterfly. Doesn't this look like it could be a dead leaf hanging underneath a plant? It's got a leaf midrib, it has some mildew spots, and then this is the stem of the leaf where it broke off of the plant. Even the body of the ruddy dagger wing is white and it keeps its antennae in line with the wings so you can barely see them. So if you were just passing by and not looking very closely and you didn't know how camouflaged the ruddy dagger wing could be, you'd probably think it was just a dead leaf. The host plant for the ruddy dagger wing might be surprising as well. It is one of our native fig trees, the strangler fig. Now we're moving into the next butterfly family, the whites and sulfurs, beginning with the great southern white. This is a medium-sized butterfly, about the size of a kiwi. And although there are different species of white butterflies in Florida, it is the great southern white that is the most common in our area of southwest Florida. You can see this butterfly is primarily white in color, although there are jagged black borders along this section of the forewing. Another noticeable feature of the great southern white is the coloring right at the ends of the antennae. You can see the turquoise color on the antennal clubs. And at first you may be thinking, oh, I'm never going to see that when a butterfly is flying around quickly. But remember, butterflies do need to stop and get nectar from flowers, as you can see in this photo. And that might be your opportunity to see the color at the ends of the antennae, especially when you know what you're trying to see. The Great Southern White is quite common because one of its host plants is very common throughout our area. That is Virginia Pepperweed. It's a relatively small herbaceous native plant that tends to grow in disturbed areas. So because of the widespread nature of Virginia Pepperweed, we are likely to see the Great Southern White in any of the parks. It does have another host plant, the bay leaf caper tree, which is a native shrub that can be used in native landscaping. The great southern white is the only white butterfly that we're going to focus on in today's training, but we'll move into the other half of this family, the yellow butterflies, generally known as sulfurs. And the two sulfurs on this slide are part of the large sulfur group. We have the cloudless sulfur butterfly on the left and the orange barred sulfur butterfly on the right. And for distinguishing between the sulfur butterflies in general, it is helpful to pay attention to the particular shade of yellow on the butterfly's wings. You can see on the cloudless sulfur on the left, it's more of an electric yellow or a highlighter yellow, extremely bright yellow. As compared to the orange barred sulfur on the right, it's more of a rich yellow with some orange patches that you can see coming through the hind wing. The orange coloring is actually on the top side of the wing, so you would see it more clearly when the butterfly is flying around. But you can see this orange glow coming through from the top side of the hind wing. Another way to distinguish between sulfur butterflies is to look at the more intricate, subtle markings that they have on the wings. That is something that will come with practice and more experience identifying butterflies, so we won't focus on that here. So for today's purposes, taking a look at the different shades of yellow between these two large sulfur butterflies. Now we're going to shift our focus to a couple of the small sulfurs. If you notice in the top right hand corner, these are both butterflies in the small category, about the size of a cherry without the stem. 
and we have the dainty sulfur on the left and the barred yellow on the right. And just as we did with the larger sulfur butterflies on the previous slide, we're going to pay close attention to the shades of yellow on their wings to help us identify them. On the left side, the dainty sulfur is overall soft yellow in color. It does have a deeper yellow color towards the leading edge of the forewing. On the other hand, the barred yellow actually appears much more white in coloration in this photo. It has some gray speckling over the wings, and it does have an area of soft yellow that you can see on the underside of the forewing. It's important to note that the barred yellow butterfly can appear in different colors depending on the time of the year. This photo on the right side of the screen was taken during the summertime, the rainy season, which is when the barred yellow tends to have this mostly white appearance with a tinge of yellow. In the wintertime or the dry season, the barred yellows tend to have more of a soft yellow appearance, similar to what we see on the hind wing for the dainty sulfur. However, there is an easy way to always identify the dainty sulfur as separate from the barred yellow, and those are these black dots on the underside of the forewing. It reminds me like somebody left a black pen sitting on a piece of paper too long and you developed a spreading ink stain. That's what I think of when I see the black spots on the underside of the dainty sulfur, and those are not present on the barred sulfur, excuse me, the barred yellow. They just have the gray speckling throughout the wings. The host plants for the dainty sulfur, it's a single host plant that many gardeners are familiar with, the beggar ticks, also known as Spanish needles. It is a native wildflower that tends to spread quite aggressively and has seeds that get stuck to our socks and our clothing. So sometimes people aren't the biggest fans of the beggar ticks although it is the host plant for the dainty sulfur butterfly. For the barred yellow, it's more of a generalist when it comes to host plants. It uses a variety of herbaceous plants and the pea family as host plants. And both of these small sulfur butterflies are very common throughout Collier County and should be expected in all of the parks. Now it's time to turn the page and move on to our next family of butterflies. Now we'll be talking about the blues and the hair streaks. First off with a couple of small, common blue butterflies. They are very small, about the size of a blueberry. And we'll be looking at the Cassius blue versus the Serranus blue on this slide. And first of all, you might be wondering why they're called blue butterflies at all. They look pretty gray in these pictures. Well, they're called blue butterflies because the top side of the wings, especially for the males, is blue in color. And you can see flashes of blue when they're flying around over the low grasses. For the Cassius blue, the main background pattern on the underside of the wings is white and gray with a very streaky pattern. If you look at the background color for the Serranus blue, it's more of a smooth gray with less streaking. It's helpful for distinguishing these butterflies to pay attention to the back part of the hind wing where there's these two black spots for the Cassius blue only one black spot for the Serranus blue. Plus, at the leading edge of the hind wing for the Serranus blue, there are these two darker spots that are not present on the Cassius blue butterfly. Both of these small blues are very common throughout Collier County, and much of that is due to the fact that they will use a variety of plants in the pea family for their host plants. Now let's focus on the second half of the blues and hair streaks family. So that would be the hair streaks, personally my very favorite group of butterflies. The hair streaks are very small butterflies as well, just like the blues on the last slide. 
but the hair streaks have hair-like tails that come off the back of the hind wing. You can see some shorter tails and longer tails on the back of the gray hair streak and a pair of shorter tails on the hind wing of the mallow scrub hair streak. At first glance, these two hair streaks look very similar to each other. They're both relatively common in our area. The main feature to try to get a glimpse of would be this black dot towards the leading edge of the hind wing, more than halfway towards the base or the body of the butterfly. This black dot is present on the mallow scrub hair streak, not present on the gray hair streak. The background color of the gray hair streak is a clean, smooth gray, and it has more orange coloring to the back of the hind wing compared to the mallow scrub hair streak. And this back edge of the wing with the orange coloring, the black dot, and these hair-like tails coming off the back are very important in helping hair streak butterflies survive encounters with predators like birds or lizards. If you get close enough to a hair streak butterfly, you might notice an interesting behavior where it shuffles its hind wings back and forth. And they tend to perch with their heads downwards, like both of the hair streaks are doing in these photos. And sometimes they'll even fold their antennae downwards, like they're trying to disguise or conceal the location of their head and draw attention to the back part of their wings. So if you think of this spot as a false eye and the hair-like tails as false antennae, it's almost like the hair streak is saying, oh, pay attention here if you're going to take a bite. The predator would just get a bite of the wing instead of biting off the head and the hair streak could live to fly another day. So you might get to observe that hind wing shuffling behavior if you encounter a hair streak during the butterfly counts. The gray hair streak is a generalist butterfly. It uses a wide variety of host plants in the pea family, which means it could be encountered in a wide variety of habitats and gardens. The mallow scrub hair streak is true to its name its host plants are in the mallow family, which is another name for the hibiscus family. I'm not familiar with the mallow scrub hair streak using any non-native ornamental hibiscus, the Chinese hibiscus that's common in general landscaping. But it is frequently associated with a native mallow called common fan petals. It's a low growing plant that is sometimes mixed in with lawns and parks and residential properties. The flower is yellow, about the size of a quarter. And if you look closely enough, it does look like a small hibiscus flower. And we've reached the final butterfly family that we're going to talk about today. This is the skipper family. And you may recall from earlier that there's a lot of diversity in the skipper family. There are a lot of different species and a lot of them look very similar to each other. Skipper identification can be more of an advanced butterflying activity. But for the purposes of today, I'm going to introduce you to just two very distinctive looking skippers. The first one shown here is the long-tailed skipper, and I bet you can guess why it is called the long-tailed skipper. It has these two long and thick tails coming off the back of the hind wing. The long-tailed skipper is a small to medium butterfly, about the size of a cherry without the stem, and it is on the larger end of the spectrum as far as skippers go. It's good to realize, however, that sometimes those thick tails can be broken off of the hind wing. The skipper could have survived an encounter with a predator. So it's good to have at least one more feature to recognize the long-tailed skipper. Besides the fact that it's one of the larger skippers, 
It also has this dark brown, thick vertical line that goes up and down on the hind wing. Or if you get a glimpse of the long-tailed skipper with its wings open from above, you might get a nice view of the turquoise coloring on the top of the body of the long-tailed skipper. And do notice as well that the long-tailed skipper in this picture is missing its long tails. The long-tailed skipper is a very common skipper in our area. It's another butterfly that uses a variety of plants in the pea family to lay its eggs on. And we've, we've heard that a lot today, so you probably have a new appreciation for some herbaceous plants that uh, you might not have known what they were called, but if you've ever seen anything that looks like a little pea pod on the plant, most likely it's in the pea family, and it could very well be a host plant for one of these butterflies. Here is another very distinctive skipper. You can tell it looks very different from the long-tailed skipper on the last slide. This butterfly is the tropical checkered skipper. It is a small butterfly, especially with the wings open. It's roughly the size of a cherry without the stem. When you see the tropical checkered skipper flying around, usually low above the lawn, it will look overall like a white colored butterfly or maybe a small moth. So it's helpful to take a photo when it, this butterfly is perched, as we're seeing here, where you can see that it's almost like the butterfly really has a black background and it has all these white checks and white squares scattered over the top of the wings. There is another butterfly that looks very similar to the tropical checkered skipper called the white checkered skipper. We could see either of them or both of them in the parks. And what you want to pay attention to to distinguish between those species is look at this outer rim of the wings. You can see that there are black and white checks until you get to the tip of the forewing where it's mostly black all smeared together. We run out of the black and white checked pattern. And that is going to confirm for you that it's a tropical checkered skipper versus the white checkered skipper, which would have the black and white checks continuing all the way to the tip of the forewing. This is another butterfly that uses plants in the mallow family, like the mallow scrub hair streak we talked about before. So in areas where you see tropical checkered skippers, you could very well see mallow scrub hair streaks as well because they use the same host plants. And this is the final butterfly that we're going to learn in this training. I may have said before that I was going to present two distinctive skippers to you. Well, I actually have a third distinctive skipper I would like to introduce you to, and that's because it may be the most common skipper in all of Southwest Florida, and that is the fiery skipper. You can tell that it has this lovely fiery orange color to the wings with a few small black smudges on the underside of the wings. This skipper is smaller than the other two that we talked about, it is closer to the size of a blueberry. And the fiery skipper is in a subgroup that's known as the grass skippers, and that's because their host plants are grasses, including St. Augustine grass in the case of the fiery skipper. And the St. Augustine grass is commonly used as lawns or sod here in Southwest Florida. So that was the 20 common butterfly species in Collier County. And remember, you're not expected to memorize all of those different butterfly species prior to the butterfly count. Hopefully you picked on a couple of distinguishing characteristics that will help you tell the butterflies apart. 
or help you know when you are seeing a new species for the day that you haven't seen before. But just remember that a lot of the experience and being able to identify butterflies comes during participating in the butterfly count. So to conclude today's training, I'm going to share some of my butterfly spotting tips with you so that you can be prepared for how to notice butterflies in natural areas. It actually comes very naturally to a lot of people that they will notice that a butterfly is nearby them because our eyes notice sudden movements, especially when the object in motion is brightly colored, like a lot of butterflies are. So initially noticing that a butterfly is close to you may be very easy. However, following the butterfly as it flies away and twists and turns in different directions can be a bit more challenging. You'll learn ways to follow the butterfly long enough in order for you to identify which species it is. And you'll get a lot of practice doing that during the butterfly counts. One thing that is very important to do during a butterfly count is to scan the tops of leaves and flowers while you're walking around. And of course, we look to the tops of flowers to look for butterflies that might be paused drinking nectar from the flowers to get energy to fuel their flight for the rest of the day. But it's also important to scan the tops of leaves like the fern that's shown in this picture, especially if it's first thing in the morning and the cooler time of the year, butterflies will land on top of leaves to simply bask and warm up so that they can keep flying around later in the day. And when a butterfly is holding still basking, that's the perfect time to take a photo or identify the butterfly. When you are scanning the tops of flowers during a butterfly count, after a couple of hours, your eyes might start to get a little bit tired so it's good to know which flowers are the most attractive to butterflies and you can focus your attention on those particular plants. One of those very popular flowers is shown here. It is called beggar ticks or Spanish needles. Other people know it as its botanical name, which is Biden's alba. It is very popular, very attractive to butterflies and pollinators of all kinds. So make sure you're always looking at the beggar ticks as you conduct the butterfly count. Another super popular nectar plant with pollinators of many varieties is actually a ground cover that can be seen in lawns and parks and our front yards. It's known locally as Florida snow. Another common name is large flowered Mexican clover. This ground cover is actually native to South America, so it is an exotic plant, non-native to Florida. However, because it is so pervasive in lawns in all different areas of Florida, and it must provide copious nectar because pollinators of many kinds, like the fiery skipper shown in this picture, will visit the Florida snow all day long. Another interesting tip that I have for you related to noticing butterflies is to pay attention to shadows. And this might seem a little bit strange at first, but if you're anything like me, when you're out hiking, looking for butterflies for a few hours at a time, I'm wearing a big wide brimmed hat and that's great for sun protection but it can obscure the view of what's happening above your head and there could be butterflies flying above your head during the butterfly count so in order to decrease the chances that you will miss butterflies flying over your head 
pay attention to the small shadows moving over the ground. And if you do see a small shadow moving over the ground, be sure to look up, maybe take off your hat and check to see if it was a butterfly making that shadow. Of course, when we're out hiking around for the butterfly accounts, there will be other insects that we see along the way. And some of those insects might distract you for a moment and make you wonder, ooh, is that a butterfly flying off over there? But sometimes it'll be another kind of insect, like a dragonfly. They are pretty common butterfly decoys. They're relatively large insects that fly around quickly, and they often have these beautiful bright colors, like this bright blue on the dragonfly in this picture but you'll only be distracted by a dragonfly for a few moments before you recognize the clear wings, which will tell you it's a dragonfly, not a butterfly, and we will not need to record it during the butterfly count. As you might expect, it is the moths that can be most commonly confused with butterflies, and this makes sense because Butterflies and moths are in the same order known as Lepidoptera. They are closely related. In general, it's fine to think that most moths are nocturnal. They're active during the night. That's true that most moths are active at night, but not all of them. There are some daytime active moths like the orange spotted flower moths shown in this photo for just one example. It's also generally fine to say that moths are drab in color, lots of browns and grays, and that's true. Most moths are drab in color, but not all of them. Again, note the orange spotted flower moth for some colorful moths. Overall, though, it's going to be the skippers that are confused with moths. So if you see a small flying insect flying low above the grasses, it's brown or grayish in color, that's going to be the place where you're going to possibly get hung up wondering, is it a skipper that we need to count for the butterfly count? Or is it a moth that we don't need to count? And rather than focusing on the appearance of the flying creature, I recommend noticing the flight behavior. If it's a butterfly, they tend to alight gracefully and perch proudly on top of the flower or the leaf, so you'll have a clear view for identification. If it's a moth and it's flying low above the grass, it tends to kind of crash land against the plant and then hide under the leaves. So if you're not sure if there's a small flying creature, drab in color, is it a skipper, is it a moth, pay attention to the flight behavior to help you make the decision. If you would like to take your butterfly studying to the next level as you're getting ready for the butterfly counts, I have some resources that I can recommend to you. On the left side of the screen, you can see it says Butterflies of Southwest Florida, a guide to common and notable species. As far as I'm aware, these are the same pamphlet. They're just different editions. And these are waterproof, extremely lightweight. They're those laminated trifold field guides that you can just stick in a back pocket and easily reference butterfly photos while you're doing the butterfly count. There's also some online resources that I use frequently when I'm looking up information about butterflies or to check out additional photographs. That includes butterfliesandmoths.org, naba.org, which is the website for the North American Butterfly Association, as well as ebutterfly.org. These are all websites where butterfly lovers post their sightings and photos to share with others and it's a great place to learn more about butterflies. Congratulations, you have reached the end of the Butterfly Count training program. I hope you learned 
a little bit about how to notice butterflies in your natural surroundings, some identification tips for distinguishing different species of butterflies, and you now understand the importance of conducting butterfly counts here in Southwest Florida. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. Have fun counting butterflies. I'll see you out there.